it's a question that all of us ask, not just once, but kind of through our lives. As a child, who am I? As a teenager, trying to sort out things. Young adults, young singles, young married people, middle-aged people, older people, it, all the way through life because the world is just bombarding us with all kinds of messages. But what we're discovering in this eight-week series as we, as we kick off 2024, as we walk through the start of this year, spend, spending eight weeks, two months, asking this question, who am I? You might have caught on if you've been coming every week. We go to the same place every week to answer that question. We go to this book. The Holy Spirit breathed Word of God. And we say, God, what do you have to say to me? And very specifically, for all those that are gathered today, whether you're out in the courtyard there, whether you're in the family worship venue, online somewhere around our, around our community, around the world, or whether you're here in the worship center, uh, all of us should be, you know, should be asking this question, you know, who am I? And then saying, God, you're the one that has the answer for this. And ultimately, wherever you are today, if you have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, if you confessed your sins, accepted his grace, taken his hand to follow him, then you find your answers right here. God defines who we are. And if you're gathered online somewhere, on campus somewhere, and you're not yet a Christian, and we always have lots of people that are at Shoreline, visiting Shoreline, trying to understand the Christian faith, understand all the things we're talking about. If you come to that place where you say, Jesus, I'm taking this step, I'm receiving your grace, I'm accepting your love, I'm taking your hand, I'm following you the rest of my life, then he says, then let me tell you who you are. So if you're a Christian, this is who you are. If you're not yet a Christian, when you come to that point where you receive Jesus, this is who you become through the work of Jesus Christ. And we learned a few weeks ago that when you come to God through faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. You are no longer defined by your family history. Because if you were defined by your family history, you're probably a different person than you are today. Not that your family doesn't affect you, but your family does not determine your future. I'm thankful for that. Because I came out of an atheistic, agnostic home, and I'm a pastor. It would really be hard to be an atheistic, agnostic pastor. <laughs> Following me? <laughs> That'd be rough. Wouldn't work. But I'm a child of God, and he's changed me. And so are you if you've come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. When you come to faith in God through Jesus Christ, you become part of his kingdom. Jesus becomes your Lord, your sovereign, your ruler, the leader of your life. And that means that all of our human allegiances, although they may be important, they are a distant second to Jesus Christ being first. And that's why we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he adds all the other things to us. And so we get in, in, involved in culture and in the world and we be, take part of things, but ultimately we say, when, it come, when, when push comes to shove, my allegiance is to Jesus. And I'm about his kingdom above all other things. And then the rest is informed by my walk with him. And last week we talked about the fact that if you come to the cross, if you receive Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord, if he is your leader, then your life is about the future glory God has for you and not your past mistakes. You're not defined by what you did last week, last month, last year. You're not defined by what somebody you know, finds in your Twitter feed or your X feed, you know, from, from seven years ago, you know, five years before you were a Christian. That doesn't define you. When you come to know Jesus, when you come to the cross, it's about the future glory he has planned for you day by day by day and forevermore. And some of you are going, if that's all true, if that's what God's word says, if, that, if that's who I am, man, that's enough. That's a, I'm a child of God. I'm a member of his kingdom. My past is behind me. I have a future glory. That's enough. But don't answer yet because there's more. Don't order now. Wait, there's more. Remember you know, all those commercials they used to have? It's like, they got this, it does this. But don't order because we'll all, there's more to who you are. As a matter of fact, these eight weeks that we walk through who we are in Christ, that's still just scratching the surface. But today, today we're going to talk about, when we ask the question, who am I? I'm defined, ultimately, by my calling from above and not my worldly status. If you've come to the cross, if you receive Jesus Christ, or when you receive Jesus, 
you will discover that you are defined by God's callings, by God's purpose, by God's definition, by what he says to you and about you, not by your worldly status. And yet so many of us, even those who have received Jesus, forget this. And we let the definitions of the world define us. And it's understandable. Because, I, and I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm going to give a little contrast here, all right? I want to give a little contrast. I hold in my hand two things. I hold in my right hand a Bible, the Holy Spirit breathed Word of God. I hold in my left hand a phone. Some of you don't know this, but phones used to be just for talking with people with it to your ear, having a conversation. But there's so much more going on now. Now, understand, when, I, when I'm going to make this contrast, this is my phone. I like this phone. I use this phone. I also have an iPad that I preach from, and I also have a computer. And so I'm not anti-technology. But I want you to get a picture in your mind, all right? If, you, if the way you, you define your calling, your purpose, and your value is from God's word and God above saying, this is who you are and this is who I call you to be, you are, you are, my, you are my precious child. I am your king of all kings and I love you. I'm setting you free from your past. If you, if you, you, you can hear God's voice and God speaking, or you can listen to all the stuff that streams in, all the stuff that comes in. Now, I, I, in the mornings, I go through, do my Bible memory work by using this phone. I oftentimes read my Bible on this phone. This phone's not bad and evil in and of itself. But there's a lot of stuff that can come through this device that will tell me things about myself that are very different than this. And if you say, who am I? I'm defined by God. I'm called by God. My purpose is established by God. And if what you do is you follow all your social media and all the different voices and all the things that come your way and you say, that defines me, that defines me, that defines me, that's my calling, that's my purpose. Trust me. You're looking at two different ways of living your life and two different ways of actually seeing yourself and who you are. And so we want to begin as we do each week in this series by kind of looking at what God says, sort of the biblical and blessed way to see yourself. Who am I? What does God say? So I'm going to ask you to take your Bible. If you have a paper Bible, open it up to Romans chapter 12. If you have an e-Bible that you're using, your phone, your iPad, fantastic. Just go right to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking at three or four different passages today. We'll be in three four different passages. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, some different passages. And digging into what, and I want you to hear what God says, all right? What does God say? What is the biblical way to see yourself? And how does that biblical vision bring, to, bring blessing in your life? So here's the first thing. I am a pleasing and God-honoring offering. All of me. Through faith in Jesus, you can say, I am a pleasing and God-honoring, God-honoring offering. Look, look with me at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul, this is the one who we talked about last week, Saul, who was killing Christians, who became a, a preacher of the word and writing. He wrote this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Romans. And these words, inspired by the Spirit, say this, Romans 12, 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, these are those that have put their faith in Jesus, those who will one day. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That bodies there is not just your physical body. That's part of it. But the picture is all of yourself offered to God. Your whole self as a living sacrifice. And listen to this. Holy and pleasing to God. Do you understand that when you give your whole life to God, when you surrender yourself to him, it pleases the God of heaven. He takes delight in you. And you say, but I don't do it perfectly. Little secret, none of us do. But you seek to give yourself again and again. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Yes, sing. Yes, praise God. But ultimately, the biggest kind of worship is this. God hears all of me, and I give all of me to you. A pleasing sacrifice. Wow. What a thought. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, all the voices coming in telling you who you are. Don't believe all that. Don't buy into that. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, how you think, how you see yourself. Are you thinking biblically primarily, or are you thinking culturally? Is who you are coming from here, from above, or coming from the world around you, right? 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, God's will, God's plan, God's way, God's purpose for you. Listen to this. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God has a will for your life that is good and pleasing and perfect. And you might be saying, I've been a Christian for a while, and I don't think I'm there yet. Fully living in God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Can I tell you, I've been a pastor a long time, and I'm not there yet. Pastor, are you fully, completely walking in God's good, pleasing, and perfect will? Well, I'm walking under his grace, and I'm trying to walk hand in hand with Jesus. But has everything become perfected in me? One day, when I'm in glory, through this life, I keep striving to offer myself. We offer ourselves to God, a living, giving our lives to him again. And, but what about when I fall? What about when I stumble? You give yourself back to him again and again because he gave himself to you. He gave you his grace. He gave you his love. He gave you his hope. And understand, when we think about this idea of giving ourselves as an offering to God, we're not giving ourselves to God to somehow earn his love or to earn his salvation. That's a free gift. God gave his only son while we were still lost in sin. It's our giving ourselves is not to get God to like me, to earn my way into heaven. Our giving ourselves is a response. God, you gave everything to me, so now I give myself back to you. That's who I am. I'm a living offering given over to God day after day after day. Now, you can keep your Bible marked there in Romans 12, but turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have this picture of spiritual growth, of maturity, as we're growing to be more and more like him, as we're becoming these pleasing and God-honoring offerings, giving our lives to him. So Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to pick it up in verse 14. And we read these words, Then we will no longer be spiritual babies. We'll no longer be infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Stop right there at the end of verse 14. What, what is the scripture saying to us? When we, when we stand in Christ, when we give ourselves over to him, we're not blown around by the winds of our culture, by every different thing, you know, by, by cunning and craft that people aren't controlling us. People aren't saying who we are, but God is, right? We're no longer blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. We're not pushed all over the place easily. Instead, contrast, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. We grow up to become who he wants us to be. This is a journey of giving ourselves over to him. That's who we are. We are his people and we surrender to him. We follow him. We seek him and his kingdom first. And then verse 16. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We'll look more at that in just a minute. But here's the invitation. When you hear the word of God, and when you say, you know what, my, my, why I live in this world, my, my, my purpose, my meaning in life, is to find by what God says, not by what the world says, and all the wind that's blowing, and all the different opinions, right? And here's why I, I, I come to this conclusion. God's, God has put within me grace through Jesus, and now I give myself back to him. How much of me? All of me. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I give my whole self back to him. That's who I am. And you know what? God looks upon our lives and says, that's a pleasing offering. Do you know the God of heaven delights in you? when you seek to give yourself to him? Even with our imperfections, even with our struggles, he knows us. But he knows that when we seek to surrender our lives to him, all of our lives, all of our mind and body, all that we are, he takes delight in that. Who am I? I'm defined by what God says. And God says you can be a pleasing and God-honoring offering. Are you striving towards that? How, how often in a normal day does that come through your mind? You know, I... I'm, I exist to give myself to God, to surrender myself to God. He delights in that. Here's another thing we learn as we look at the scriptures about who we are, if we listen to God. I am a valuable and needed part of God's body. 
I am a valuable, important, and needed part of the body of Christ. That God looks at you and looks at me and says, you matter. You are valuable. You are important. And we don't hear that a lot from the world. If you listen to voices in the world, you're not, you're not hearing, you're valuable, you matter. You feel pushed off to the sides oftentimes. And God says, in my body, in my church, every single person who's come to the cross and received Jesus matters. Every per- person is valuable. And, and so in, in, this, in this call from above to, to see yourself as part of God's body, a part of God's church, it's this picture, and the passages we're going to read are from 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. The picture is kind of comparing, and you have to watch the text closely when you read this part of the Bible, because God is kind of painting a picture of two things. The physical body and the spiritual body, the church. And he jumps back and forth without sort of saying, now I'm talking about the physical body. Now I'm talking about the spiritual body. He just jumps back and forth like we're following along. So let's try to follow along. And when he's talking about the physical body, he's talking about you have different parts of your body, but you make a whole person. And in the spiritual body of Christ, the church, we all have unique places and roles, but together we form the body of Christ. And he's the head. And we're his church. It's a beautiful picture. So 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. So just as one body, though one has many parts, this is the physical body initially, though one body, though, though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Now it's going to point to a spiritual picture. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. When you're baptized, you're placed into the body of Christ. There's a spiritual reality, a picture that's going on there. All right? For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. And then this, these radical words, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. These are two of the most separated groups in the history of the world. And at that time in history, there was almost no greater divisions. You know what he says? One. Bound together. In our conflicted, torn up, cancel culture, hate other people that aren't like you world, the scripture says when you come to faith in Jesus, whatever your background... You're one. I don't know anywhere else in all the world right now where that is being taught with clarity. It's just the opposite. It's here in the family of God, in the body of Christ. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, radically divided. Boom, brought together. What a picture, what a truth whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. When you come to the cross, when you receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit moves into you, you are family. You're part of the body. You belong. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We each have our unique place, but we form one body. This this declaration that you belong. This is the message of heaven. This is the word from God. You belong in the family of God. Sometimes I don't feel like I belong. You do belong. And 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, dig into those a little bit deeper this coming week. And you're going to see this picture come out alive in a powerful way. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. And again, there's a huge passage here, but I'm going to just dig into verses 3 through 5 for a moment here. Romans 12, 3 through 5. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, this is a great reminder, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Watch the arrogance, watch the pride. I'm so important. I'm so, this is, everyone matters. But also, everyone matters, not just you, not just me, right? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober, with thoughtful judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members not all have the same function, physical body, so in Christ, spiritual, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. No, I don't. I come to church. I come online. But I do my thing. And you live your life. I live mine. I have nothing to do with you. Wrong. We belong to one another as the family of God. Like it or not, we belong. And we belong to other Christian churches around Monterey. That's why Pastor Brandon prayed today for Compass Church in Salinas. That's why we reached out to them and said, what can we pray for you for? Because we are part of the same body. That's why we're part of a body that is global, 
So we have a team of people going over to Egypt to serve there and to walk along with some brothers and sisters there. And those folks that go on that trip will come back saying, I have family members in Egypt I never met before. And I'm going to see them one day in glory. But I got to walk with them for a little while in this life. Wow. We are a family. We are the body. And so we need each other. We belong to each other. We're part of a body. That's what God says. We're not isolated. We're together. What else does God's word say? Continuing through these passages. It says, I am gifted by God, and I add to his divine movement in the world. That the word of God actually says that when you come to God through faith in Jesus, he not only moves into you by his Holy Spirit, he not only saves you from your sin, he not only destines you for heaven, he not only calls you his child, he not only says that you're part of my kingdom, he not only says that your past is gone, your future is glorious, but he says, I got something I want to do in you and through you to change this world. And he uniquely gifts every Christian with a, with, with a charismata, with a, a, a gift of the Spirit. And God places in every believer unique, a unique gift or ability or abilities to use for the glory of God. Look with me at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, different ways that God moves through us, but the same Lord, the same Jesus. There are different kinds of working, of ways of doing work for Jesus, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Hope you notice the Spirit, the Son, and the Father there. That's the Trinity right there together working in us. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, looking at verse 6. For we have different gifts, because we're different parts, different people. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is serving, then serve. If your gift is teaching, then teach. If your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. If your gift is giving, then give generously. If your gift is to lead, then do it diligently. If your gift is to show mercy, then show mercy cheerfully. What's the picture? That the Word of God says, when you come to, to the living God through faith in Jesus, the Spirit of God moves into you and gives a unique ability to use for His glory. I don't know what your unique gifting from God is. I don't know what it is, but I know if you're a Christian, He's placed something in you. I know if you're not a Christian, you become a Christian, God will place something in you. Some of you are like, then how do I figure that out? Some of you are asking, like, well, how do, how do I sort all that out? Here's the good news. Today, right after the service, right up these stairs in the corner room there, the garden room, we've got a short, like, one-hour class, walking into these passages a little bit and giving you a little assessment to figure out what your unique gifting is. And then if you want to, we'll have somebody meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk and pray and help you find your pathway to step into whatever God has for you to use your gifts for his glory. We're after that after the first service, after the second service, and online, 1 o'clock. If you're online, at 1 o'clock online, go on the website, register, and that same class is offered to you wherever you are in the world. And then you can begin to use that gift for the glory of Jesus. And if you're online and you want to meet with someone one-on-one -on -one to, to sort that out and figure out how you can step into serving Jesus, we'll do that with you online. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one person meet with you online. But we want every person to step into who God has made them because this is who, who am I? I'm a person gifted by the God Almighty. And the church becomes a better, better place and the world becomes a better place when you use your gifts. It's true. And some of you are just kind of like, no, no, you don't understand, Pastor. I came to the cross, I received Jesus. I come to church, you know, come online, come to church for an hour and then that's pretty much the package. And God says, oh no, there's so much more. And your greatest joy in life will come when you find out what your gifting is. And you feel the Holy Spirit of the living God pour through you and use the gift that he's given you and develop that gift. And you look and God blesses other people through you. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. If you're missing out on that, jump in. Sort it out. It's one of the things we talk about a lot here at Shoreline Church. And then one more kind of picture biblically of, of who we are if we understand the scriptures. And this will challenge some of you. But this is what the word of God says. All right, here, here you go. I am a source of unity and blessing to others. I am a source of unity and blessing to others. And some of you go, you don't know me very well, Pastor. I don't feel like I'm a uniter, and I don't know if I'm necessarily pouring out blessing on people. So you don't know my story. 
No, but God does. And God actually says, if you've come to him through faith in Jesus, if you've come to the cross and received his grace, if his spirit lives in you, if you know who you are, you will begin to be a source of blessing and unity to other people. You say, I don't see it yet. God's still at work. Listen to this word from 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26. Talking about the body of Christ, still talking about the body of Christ, the family of God, all those believers who put their faith in Jesus, right? Here's what it says. So that there should be no division in the body. If you're part of the church, no division in the body. Doesn't mean we don't have different tastes. Doesn't mean we always get along, but we're not divisive. We're not living in that conflict. There should be no division in the body. But that its parts should have equal concern for each other. That we care about each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I hit my thumb with a hammer, my whole body experiences it. You're hurting, and the family experiences it if we're being the church. Because we're united, we're bound together. And you know what? When we take all the world's input, we live like this. Keep myself safe. Keep myself away from you people. All you dangerous people. Right? And God says, no, we're a family. We belong to each other. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, when your life is defined by what the world says, not what God said. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. There's things we live behind, leave behind. To made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Growing in true righteousness and holiness. We're being transformed by Jesus. Two great theological words. Salvation and sanctification. Great words. If you're a note taker, write these down. Salvation. Salvation is when we put our faith in Jesus. Salvation happens when you receive Jesus Christ, when you finally get it. We had somebody last week who came up to me and said, a couple weeks ago, I, I, you, you shared the message of Jesus, and I wasn't ready to respond. The person had gotten a Bible, still kind of investigating the Christian faith. Last week, this person came up and said, I think I'm waiting to get my life all together so I can be all together, then give myself to Jesus. And this person said, I'm never going to get there, are you? And I said, no, you're not. He said, so I probably just receive Jesus now. I said, yes, you should. If you're ready, and he says, absolutely. And we prayed together, standing right here last Sunday. Because he'd heard the gospel a few weeks ago, but he was, he was trying to pull himself together and make himself presentable to God. But, but that's, that's not a thing we can do. So, 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 salva- so this person prayed, and in that moment that he confessed his sins, that moment he received Jesus Christ, took the hand of Jesus, said, I will, I will receive your grace and follow you as my leader. Salvation, he became a Christian. Okay, that's salvation. It happens in a moment when you finally understand and receive Jesus. Sanctification is growing up and becoming like Jesus. That takes all your life. I, 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 I've never met anyone who I think has absolutely so sanctified that they are perfectly like Jesus in this life. So give yourself some grace because God gives you a lot of grace. But keep striving forward to grow to become more and more like Jesus. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. But I'm not there yet. That's okay. Keep striving towards that. Keep walking towards Jesus. So here's what God says that we've just looked at so far today. Your life can become a pleasing offering to God. You're a valued part of his body. You're divinely and uniquely gifted. And you can be a source of unity and blessing. Hear it. Receive it if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, dream of what your life could be through faith in Jesus. But God's not the only voice speaking to us. There's other voices. So what does the world say? What are some of the confused and corrupted messages that we're having rifled at us from the world? And these aren't ones I have to say a whole lot about because you're going to hear them and you're going to go, yep, I've heard that voice. How about this? Your value is based on your most recent accomplishment. Here's your value. What have you done this week? I got a great marriage. I'm valuable. My marriage blew up. Guess I'm not valuable. That's what the world will say. I got a great job, right? I'm, I'm a, I, I matter. My company downsized. I, I don't, you start to believe the voice. I guess I don't matter anymore. 
I'm in great shape. I matter. Kind of out of shape. Guess I don't matter. Anybody here ridden that roller coaster? <laughs> right? No. No. You're not defined by your most recent comp- accomplishment or your most recent struggle or failure. You're defined by God. And when you know who, what God says, look at this now. You're here. This is who you are. doesn't change. Don't ride the roller coaster. Just stand in who God says you are. What does the world say? Your worth is directly connected to your net worth. Your worth in this world is connected to dollars and cents, your net worth. The house you live in, the car you drive, what you have in your bank account. The world gives that message, and God says, not so. God says, ultimately, the greatest riches are not things you can buy with dollars and cents. The greatest riches are what God gives to you and what he offers to you in Jesus and in this life. What does the world say? It says, your life is a brief and flickering flame that will soon burn out. And game over. Done. Darkness, nothing, gone. And God says, no, no. I'm going before you to make a place for you so that where I am, you can be also with me. The disciples say, we don't know the way. Jesus, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the way to the Father. If you come to the cross and receive Jesus, you are not a brief and flickering flame that will one day be snuffed out by history and time and forgotten. You are precious in God's sight and valued beyond understanding. And by the way, so is every person around you. Valuable in God's sight. And if they put their faith in Jesus, they become God, part of God's family. If they don't, they don't become part of God's family. And some people say, well, that's mean. No, it's not. If I tell somebody, you become part of my family, I grab them and drag them in, they don't want to be there. The people that are part of God's family, the people that have said, I want to be part of God's family. And he doesn't say no to anybody. Jesus made a way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But no one comes to the Father except through him. So with that in mind, how should I view myself and others? What do I understand and embrace? How do, how do I see the human family? How do I see the church family uniquely? All right? Let's think about the church family for a moment. All, now when I say the church, I mean the church universal, the church global, all over the world. Right? If you're a follower of Jesus, we can bring delight and joy to the heart of the God who made us. You can make, if you, as you give yourself a living offering to God, it's holy and pleasing to Him. How do you view yourself? You can bring joy to the heart of God by following him, by seeking him first, by doing your best to walk in his ways. When you stumble, you seek his grace. When things go well, you give him glory. But God delights in us. So we can bring delight and joy to the heart of God. How do we see ourselves and those who put their faith in Jesus? We have something of eternal value to add to God's church. You have something of eternal value to bring to the church, to the family of God. You do. Say, I don't know what it is. Then find out. I I can't even imagine what would happen in a community if every follower of Jesus were to find out how God has uniquely gifted them and prayerfully, humbly use that gift at home, at school, in their workplace, on the sports field, in neighborhoods, in families the thousands upon thousands of thousands of Christians in this community and those that are part of Shoreline Church lived out who God has made us to be. What could God do? It's staggering. You can only answer for one person. That's you. But understand that God wants to flow through you and bring blessing to this world. How do we see ourselves and others? We understand that our God-given gifts can change the world. Your God-given gift, singing on a worship team, playing drums on a worship team. There's somebody up in a little room, right back behind the screen over here, up in a little room up there, who's got all these knobs and switches. I have no idea how they work. But they're mixing this service for between 1,500 and 2,000 people that are online. Maybe more than that today because I heard there's some kind of sporting event later today. I don't know for sure. But might be a few more online than usually online, but that's okay, right? But someone else is up there, and then there's somebody actually with the thing, that, with the different cameras saying, okay, go to this camera, go to this camera, all, you see, all that stuff. There's, there's people caring for kids right now in classes and in the nursery. There's people that are going to be meeting with middle school and high school and young adult uh, people 
here on our campus and, and around our community, pouring into their lives. There's people teaching classes. There's people that are going to be handing out food and clothes to people in need. There's some way God can flow through you. And when you discover it and use that gifting, man, the world begins to change. So last thought, our last question we ask each week. How should my perspective impact my pathway? If I understand this, if I understand what God's Word says, and if I begin to walk in the ways of Jesus, how should that impact the pathway where I walk and what I do? A couple closing thoughts. I should offer my whole self to God every day of my life as I get ready for eternity. As I prepare for eternity one day, every day I say, God, I'm yours. God, this day is for your glory. My life is for you. I offer myself a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is my spiritual act of worship. God, here I am. Boy, if you prayed every morning, just as you're getting out of bed, laying flat in bed, get out of bed, get on your knees, or as you're you know, getting, getting dressed for the day, whatever it is, to say, God, I give my whole self to you today, a living sacrifice, an offering. Do what you want to do in me and through me. What might God do? How might he open your eyes to see a need and then move your heart to meet that need that you might have just walked right past before? What happens when we give our whole lives? This, this is what we're called to do. This is how we live our lives. How should my perspective impact my pathway? I can value and love members of God's family because we are related forever. Man, start blessing other Christians wherever you can. Let them know what you appreciate about them. Pray for other churches in our community. Pray for other churches around the world. We are a family. Be nice to each other. Be kind to each other. Be gracious to one another. How should our understanding change our pathway? I need to discover, develop, and deploy my spiritual gifts. I've got to find my place in serving for the glory of Jesus. Every new members class I lead. I, I, I've led every new members class for the last 14 years. So I'm going to talk to every single person who's thinking about joining Shoreline Church. And I say, if you're going to come to Shoreline Church, that's great. If you're going to just hang out here and receive, that's great. If you're going to join the church, that means you're stepping in and using your gifts at a different level. That's an invitation to step in. I, I spent six years of my life studying this one concept. How do you build a church around the gifts of all of God's people and not around pastors. I spent six years studying that topic at the highest level of my education because that's the church and you have something to offer. And when you do, it changes you, it brings glory to God, it changes the body of Christ, and it changes the world. So, What's the primary source of defining who you are? From above or from around the world? At the end of the day, you don't define me. My kids don't define me. My friends don't define me. Not even my wife defines me, much as I love her. God says who you are. And when you meet him through faith in Jesus, and when you walk in that, everything changes. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today that you would speak to our hearts, that we would understand who we are because of faith in you, and that those who don't yet know you would have a vision today of who they could become when they place their faith in you. Oh, God Almighty, we get pushed around by the winds and the storms of this world, so many voices telling us what we're worth and what we're not worth. And off, too often we believe in those things. I pray right now, Lord Jesus, for those people who are believing lies, that their worth is their net worth, that their worth is this relationship or that job or this thing or that thing, Lord, and they, they're not listening to you. Let them hear your voice. Let them hear your word this day. God, let us step into being your people at a deeper, richer level than we ever have before and find the incredible joy and satisfaction of walking with you. We pray this in your name, Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Before I invite you to stand, before I send you off with a word of blessing, just two quick invitations. One is if you've never been baptized, but you've given your heart to Jesus and you want to consider being baptized, we have a baptism class today at 1230 today, 
in the Peninsula Room, which is kind of right through the lobby over this way. If, you're not, if you can't find anything here, go to the Connection Center here in the lobby, and they'll tell you where it is. But that's going to be at 12.30 today, uh, right in the middle of some sporting event. And so if you, uh, but if you want to be there, be there, all right? And then... Also, I mentioned before, spiritual gifts class. It's a one-hour class. Introduce you to the idea of how God has uniquely gifted you. And if you, ha if you have one hour right now, when I send you off the word of blessing, you can go upstairs either. We open up the doors here. We don't use, have those open right there. The class is right there. Or there's stairs downstairs so you can go up. And just go check out that class. If you can give one hour, you'll get some insight to yourself and how God's made you that will be glorious and amazing. If you need prayer today, and you're on campus, and you're on campus, please, before you leave, come in here into the worship center. Come up front, and we're going to have teams that would be honored to pray for you. And if you're online, I know last week our online person was live chatting prayers with a bunch of you last week. You can live chat with your online host, uh, and, or you can email us those prayers, the address you see, and we will put that on our prayer list, and our prayer team will jump in and be praying faithfully for you. And also, if you're new at Shoreland, if you're new and you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see right there on your screen. We will reach out to you and connect with you. If you're on campus, we want just a moment with you. Go by the Connection Center. Just say, hey, I'm new at Shoreline. Or if you've been coming here for a couple of months but you've never gone by the Connection Center, just go by and say, hey, this is my first time in the Connection Center. And they want to give you a little gift and thank you for coming and answer your questions. So be sure you connect before you leave the campus. If you're able to stand physically, if you're able to stand online, family worship venue, courtyard, worship center, would you stand with me and just put your heart in a place of receiving as I send you out with this word of blessing. As you go from this good and sweet time together with God's family, will you know who you are because of what the word of God says and what the spirit of God seals in your heart? And will you close your ears to the lies of the world so that you can more and more walk in the grace of Jesus? God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you back here next Sunday. Praise, praise the one who sees.